name is Vicki Molta, and this is You and Your Mental Wellness. Uh, we do this show once a month, and the purpose of the show is to talk about uh, hope, recovery, that people can get better from mental health issues. And I've been doing this show for about four years now, and, and um, I've had a lot of really great guests on, and I have a really good guest on tonight. Uh, that's going to talk about an article that he wrote about 22 years ago and I wanted to ask him about if it's still pretty prevalent today and <clears throat> his name is Dr. Robert Ostroff and he, he's the director of adult inpatient psychiatric services at Yale Psychiatric Hospital and he wrote an article in, in back in 1992 called Mentally Ill <coughs> excuse me Mentally ill must fight prejudice too, and the whole purpose was that um, psychiatric patient. Why don't you explain to me the the um, gist of what the article was about? You're going to test my memory. <coughs> Thank you for having me. So it's been 22 years. Yeah, it was in 1992 um, that that you wrote that article, and and you were mostly talking about discrimination. You know that there's a very intense discrimination among um, that people have toward people with mental illness. And that, um, and I just wanted to ask you if things have changed in light of, you know, things that have happened in the media, and and um, if there's been progress. There, that's one aspect. But before we cover that, I want I want to mention somebody. I know it sounds like I'm all over the place, but I want to mention um, Sherry Hoffman because she was the one that introduced this article to me, and. The whole purpose of the article, aside from the discrimination, is that patients in psychiatric hospitals don't get flowers when they're on the ward like um, people in other units do, like cardiac patients. And So I just want to ask you, first of all, why, why you think it's, it's that way? Why do you think? What, what I was trying to point out was the, the subtle and not so subtle discrimination against people with psychiatric disorders which aren't really any different than any other kind of uh, illness that people have but that there's profound discrimination. The example in that article was that people work at companies that have flower funds that everybody chips into and they send flowers and get well cards to people when they're in the hospital with a heart attack but rarely do my patients get flowers and that actually hasn't changed very much in the last 22 years they still don't get flowers and some in some areas the stigma is better but it tends to be isolated in other areas it's just as bad if not worse and there are lots of examples of how it's worse so do you think that people who go still get um, admitted to psychiatric hospitals is, is considered like a mark of shame among maybe their family members or themselves and that it shouldn't be acknowledged that they're in a psychiatric hospital? I think or? that's actually much less. I, I think people are much more comfortable acknowledging having a psychiatric illness and needing psychiatric treatment. I, I think the, at least what I've seen over the last two decades, and it's been actually longer than that, is that people are more comfortable talking about it in an opening, open way. People blog on the internet or post things about their own experiences, which I think has been helpful, but I still think that there's an uh, inequity around things like funding for mental health issues, housing, Right. Uh, that, that there's a subtle discrimination and it's very easy to uh, pick on groups that don't have much of an advocacy compared to something like people with cancer or debilitating illnesses like ALS is getting a lot of publicity now because of the ice bucket challenge and that right. we don't have anything as dramatic or as, as singularly captivating for people with mental illness. So the funding is less, reimbursement is less for services, people carry a larger burden, even in the federally funded programs there's, there's market discrimination. Right. And if you look back to when I wrote the piece you're referring to in 1992 and you look in 2014 we actually have less public funds available in Connecticut for people with psychiatric disorders. In 1992 there were three psychiatric hospitals uh, Fairfield Hills, Nor Norwich Hospital and 
CVH, two mm -hmm. of those have closed, and it started under Governor Rowland, and we've systematically closed services, and now they're targeting residential services. So right. it's an easy group to cut funding. So how for. do you feel about that? That they've they've um, shut down those hospitals. Do you feel that since they shut down those hospitals, there have been um, there's not enough housing in the community for people with mental health well, issues. Well, the promise was that you would close a hospital, but you'd provide more outpatient services, and that's never been done in an equitable way. It's not, so if $2 was saved over here, it's not that $2 was put into other services, a dollar was put into other services, where if you get, do away with a hospital, you actually have more intensive needs in other settings like residential and community-based treatment. Mm -hmm. And those funds have been systematically cut, housing funds have been systematically cut, and it's becoming a major issue for people with serious debilitating psychiatric illness to find the services they need. Right, right. So you think there's a large percentage of people that aren't getting the services that they need that maybe um, because they don't, they're not aware maybe that they have a mental illness or, or that they um, don't want to get help or? No, actually I think if you, if you went back 20 years ago, I think there was an avoidance of care even from people who needed it. So people who needed treatment weren't getting treated. I think there's a problem now that people who need treatment and seek it out either for themselves or their family members can't easily access it. And some of it is cost and some of it is insurance reimbursement, but there's a shortage of people providing mental health services now because of these cutbacks and reimbursement and funding over the years. We have a national shortage of psychiatrists. We have a shortage of psychiatric nurses and social workers. People have trouble accessing care even when they want it and even when they're not indigent now, even right. in Connecticut, which is a relatively wealthy state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've, um, I know a lot about Connecticut Mental Health Center and maybe other centers too. And um, what do you think about people who, do get services like with a, um, either a case manager or a clinician and there's a lot of turn you f do you feel there's a lot of turnover so you're saying there's a lot of turnover among um, the clinicians and the and the um, other mental health providers and do you feel that that makes it even harder for well I think there's an actual shortage I think there's a, a shortage in Connecticut that was estimated that that in New England we're short roughly 1500 uh, psychiatric professionals, psychiatrists, nurse practitioners, social workers, psychiatric nurses, just mm -hmm. to provide the care for people who need it and want it, not to mention people who are avoiding treatment. So on any given day, most places in Connecticut, if not New England in general, are looking for staff. There's a chronic need for staff. And, and part of that has been this systematic cutback in jobs and physicians have made people uh, less interested in going into that field even if they have interest. Mm -hmm. So when I talk to the psychiatric residents at Yale, I tell them the good news is you won't have any trouble finding a job anywhere you want to go because there's such a need right now, right. such a demand. But if you think about the causes of death in adults in America and you look at the top ten causes, three of them are psychiatric illnesses. It's depression, uh, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia are among the the three leading causes of death of adults in America. That's, that's really, that's So that's it's up there with amazing. AIDS and it, get, and, but the funding is, is very small compared to what we're doing for research and development and healthcare for other kinds of major psychiatric, major, I'm sorry, major medical disorders. So um, just on the side, uh, you know, uh, with Robin Williams um, taking his life, do you think these media portrayals of, um, you know, celebrities who who have mental illness, do you think it really helps um, to, do you think people really want to try to understand more about um, what mental illness is and, and not, not be so afraid of it? Because you wrote in your article, I remember, um, I, I read your article and you said something about um, that people, people are afraid of things that they don't understand. And um, so, how, is that how, do you still feel that way when you, as when you wrote that before? The oh, I don't think people have changed in 20 <laughs> years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I think the Robin Williams case is a tragedy and it makes people think about it and appreciate it, 
but there are these subtle uh, prejudices and stigmas that come across even in their portrayal of his problem and his illness. He, he keeps being identified as somebody who was suffering from depression where he made it very public that he has bipolar, he had bipolar disorder and suffered from bipolar disorder. And the news media, on the one hand, I think tries to simplify it and talk about it, that it's depression. Right. And that more people have a sense of what depression is than have a sense of what bipolar disorder is. But actually the completed suicide rate in people with bipolar disorder is the highest of all mental disorders. And it's not a surprise when somebody dies from that disorder, particularly if they're not getting effective treatment. I don't know anything about his treatment, but I do know that he gave a number of interviews where he talked about suffering from bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. One of the things I've seen about the stigma over the last two plus decades is that these illnesses tend to get accepted generally illness by illness. So right. if you went back 20 years ago, people were getting comfortable saying they suffered from alcoholism and it was no longer a big stigma to need detox or need to go to rehab because you were an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. In the last 10 years or so, I think depression has become like that. So people will talk about suffering from depression. Now, if you think about it, one in 10 adults in America suffers from alcoholism, a substance abuse problem. One in uh, five adults at some time during their life has an episode of depression. So these are common things and easy to understand. But in some ways, when, you, when I hear about Robin Williams and they keep talking about depression, I keep thinking, why don't they identify his illness correctly? And some of it is people are not yet comfortable talking about bipolar disorder, but they're comfortable talking about having alcoholism or having depression. But that's, so it's a slow change in that way. Right. But again, if you go back to things like funding sources, like the federal government, what they're doing research in, there's been just this enormous cutback in funds from the National Institute of Mental Health for doing research in these illnesses. And some of that has to do with not having an effective lobbying group and the stigma, and that it's, and it doesn't serve people with these illnesses well because it's hard to lobby for them and it's hard for people to speak up about them and get the research dollars that we need to understand them better, to get the health care we need to understand them better. Mm -hmm. So when you first got involved in um, your work, did you foresee that all that these types of issues w would be coming up when you started maybe um, when when you started years ago? Um, was it and I, I also want I have a lot of questions and I, I don't mean to sound like I'm all over the place, but I also want to know like wh um, how, how you got drawn to working working in the field of as a psychiatrist and um, with people with mental health issues and and if you feel it sounds like you have a real heart for um, you know for people um, who are struggling and d is it hard not to get not to feel maybe um, frustrated sometimes or bitter because because of these systemic um, it's not my nature to feel bitter, but let me, let me try to answer each question. I went into psychiatry because of curiosity and interest, and then I found it an interesting field. And it also, 30 years ago when I was making this choice, it seemed like an area where there was about to be an explosion of new information. And that I thought in 1980 we were like cardiology was in 1950. And we were just beginning to understand things about what causes, what cause, what are the causes of these illnesses, and how better to effectively treat them. Uh, I did not, I don't remember thinking very much about the stigma or the prejudices that people would have to fight. That became more apparent when I was training, and then after my training, it became uh, more more apparent that it was a pervasive problem. And it's and it's really. Uh, a systemic problem in the whole system about some of the prejudices about mental illness, including in the field itself. So people have been are very comfortable now doing things like paying a lot of money for a medication, but we don't have enough money for people to have decent housing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if, and the cost of one of these new medications that we really don't need and doesn't add anything probably would provide housing for everybody who needs it in America. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole funding. Uh, problem that I think relates to not being able to think clearly about 
how to treat people with psychiatric disorders and how to help them. Mm -hmm. So as a result, you know, you were saying there's not enough housing and not enough su supports in the community. So do you see p a lot of people cycle in and out of the, out of the hospital because they, they just don't have the proper supports to um, feel sa safe? I mean, I've, there's that Maslow um, hierarchy where if you don't have a place to, to live, right. that's yeah. the first thing, you know, you don't have, you don't feel safe or secure. and. We see people who might have avoided ending up being in a hospital and needing a psychiatric hospitalization if they had adequate housing and support in the community. And, mm -hmm. and we see that every day. And that's, that's really rampant in Connecticut. I don't think that's something that we just see in New Haven. But if you went to any large metropolitan area in, New, in Connecticut, Hartford, Bridgeport, New Haven, we see people who because they don't have adequate housing, everything trickles down from there. Mm -hmm. They don't have adequate ways of, of, of accessing the care they need. They don't get the care they need. They end up in the hospital. Mm -hmm. It's a very expensive alternative to providing quality housing. Right, right. I was, uh, um, I worked at this, um, I was part of this organization called Keep the Promise, which was um, in Middletown, but out of Hartford too. And they were talking about how um, a governor in the past had promised a certain amount of money for, for mental health outpatient in the community mental health services and how he never really followed through with that and um, they we talked about issues like housing and and how important it is and how expensive it it is for people you know to keep going in and like you're saying in and out of the hospital or or getting arrested for misdemeanors and um, you know, I want to. Do you feel that maybe jails are almost like um, um, the new mental hospital in a way? Because um, I don't know how new that is. They've always had a disproportionate number of people with mental illness in hospitals, but I don't think it was an accident that Roland closed the hospital in Fairfield, where in Fair in uh, Newington Fairfield Hills, and now there's a. a prison on the grounds of what used to be the psychiatric hospital oh, really? with its own uh, medical services. And I'm not, I, I don't know anything about the quality of psychiatric services that are administered in prisons, but I suspect you'd be better off in a psychiatric hospital than a prison to receive the help you need. Right. Part of the problem is the politicians who make these decisions share in these prejudices and biases, so they do things that are in response to public events that don't make any sense and don't help anything. Mm -hmm. So an example of that is after Sandy Hook, instead of focusing on providing more psychiatric services in the schools and more recognition, we have a, a gun permit law now that says if you're hospitalized voluntarily for a psychiatric illness, your name goes in a database to prevent you from getting right. a permit, which sounds not totally unreasonable, but it what it leaves out is that if you're hospitalized involuntarily in a psychiatric hospital because you don't have the wherewithal to even understand that you need help and that you might have done something dangerous, your name does not go on the list. It's only mm -hmm. if you voluntarily come to seek help. Mm -hmm. So in a way that dissuades people who actually want and need the help and right. are looking for it right. from seeking it out. So that's um you know, it just seems like we have a long way to go still before, um, I just, you know, I think about, like we've talked about with the housing, because that was something really important to me. I wrote a lot of articles to um, newspapers about <coughs> the importance of affordable housing and, um, but do you think, do you think maybe um, in the future, do you feel that there should be state hospitals again or do you think that that would help people like if we if they reopened re well there's a, there is clearly a shortage of hospital beds in Connecticut every hospital every psychiatric unit is running close to a hundred percent so there there on any given day there probably aren't quite enough beds but I don't think the answer is more psychiatric hospital beds I think the answer is more alternative services like housing and community support and treatment on an outpatient basis. I don't think anybody should be in the hospital unless they can't get the care they need anywhere else. The problem is we have this very narrow area of getting the care you need and then there are people who have other needs like housing and 
organizational needs that aren't getting met in the community. There's just not enough resources available to them. Right, right. Now I wanted to ask you also about um, with the, with the floor the um, with with the hospital in your hospital. Would you say that there are a lot of people who have co-occurring disorders too? Because that can with um, you know drug addiction and you know substance abuse along with mental illness. Is that is there a large population of that too? And about fifty percent of people with psychiatric illness suffer from co-occurring or comorbid substance abuse problems like alcohol, typically. Mm -hmm. Mm. And it's a very common problem to need to treat both. Right, right. I think the treatment of both has actually gotten better. If you went back 20 years ago, uh, groups like AA were actively discouraging people from taking uh, psychiatric medications. Right. So if you had psychiatric illness that you needed medication for and you had alcoholism, it was very hard to get treated for the alcoholism on an outpatient basis because AA would encourage you to stop all medication because right. it was a crutch. They've gotten better educated and, and much more uh, sophisticated about their approach to people with both problems. Mm -hmm. so, um, so what do you think about the, um, the newer medications? Do you think that they're a lot more effective than, than they were like maybe in the 80s and you know the atypical psychiatric medications and no actually I don't I think there's very there's very little that's uh, happened that's been new and effective in the last 30 years since Clozeril was introduced to the market and the atypical antipsychotics are not that atypical and they cost a fortune and they're much they're much more expensive than what I would call the first generation drugs some of which are very effective or as effective and cost four dollars at certain pharmacies but the pharmaceutical industry has been hyping these drugs for years so everybody thinks they're better but the data that actually differentiates them from the first generation medications is actually pretty weak mm -hmm. so we have drugs that we don't need that are we spend roughly a billion billions of dollars a year on and we don't have enough housing so right uh, that's an area that's an area that I could get frustrated and not bitter, but annoyed about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You um. So, what can be done about that? Do you think there needs to be more people to um, just be more politically involved and in, in um. Well, I think going I think raising public awareness is he helpful. I think uh, having more people politically involved and advocating is helpful. I think it's it's hard to say that we don't have a system of centralized health care where. If you spend, if you don't spend a billion dollars on a drug you don't need over here, you'll have a billion dollars for housing. But at some point in a rational system, we should be making those choices better. Mm -hmm. um, so it just seems like in many ways we still have a long way to go before, pro you know, thinking about what the priorities are for people and, and um, uh, Oh, so I'm trying to think what else. Um, we don't have too much time left. We only have a couple of minutes left. But I just, <coughs> I just want to kind of go full circle again and just, um, you know, talk since we only have a little bit of time left. Um, uh, Sherry had some, you know, Sherry was. It's very dear to her heart to that. Um, she she really wanted florists to provide discounts um, for people to buy flowers. To bring to patients on the wards, and um, and and she had there were a number of things that she um, ideas that she had um, that that um, she wanted to know how how what the percentage is of patients who receive flowers while psychiatric patients while they're in the hospital. Probably one in a hundred. Really, it's not very common. And and. Why, and is it be, why is that? Again, I think it's the discomfort in thinking about what people who have a psychiatric disorder need. People are still afraid to even visit their friends in the hospital because they think it'll be embarrassing to come and see their friends while they're on a psychiatric unit. They uh, much less bring them flowers or send flowers from the office. Mm -hmm. So there's still it, it's still an area that is not easily openly talked about by everybody. So flowers are, are a symbol of a validation, a caring for the other person that uh, who who is sick, and and um, 
when people don't have that validation and that that um, loving support in the in the symbol of flowers, um, it makes it extra hard, and it just goes back full circle again to the discrimination. It makes it much harder to want to get well if you don't have people behind you that are really want you to get better and and are supportive of you and. Do you think that makes it hard, harder for people to get better when they don't have? Oh, absolutely. If you're a 24-year-old and you suffer from a severe depressive illness and end up in the hospital and your parents are ashamed of you and don't want to tell any of their friends, that makes it a lot harder than if they tell their friends, their friends send you flowers and, and people are supportive of what you're going through and recognize that it's a disorder. It right. goes without saying. Mm -hmm. You said it better than I did. Well, um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else, just, um, you know, uh, I wanted to, um, so to fi finally close things off, end things um, for tonight, what would you like to see changed? You, you, t you were talking about housing and, you know, supportive housing and changes in the community and are there any other Well, I things? think that I'm, I'm talking about that in the sense that I think that's a trickle-down effect of not viewing these illnesses the way you view, view other illnesses. If we had, didn't have enough services for cardiac rehab after somebody had a heart attack when they need to go to rehab for two weeks and get physically trained and back into shape, we didn't have enough services. There would be a public outcry for that. And yet every day we struggle with people who are leaving the hospital who don't have access to really adequate services uh, that they need. So I don't think it's so much any one thing. but. I think the, the issue about stigma is, is that it not only affects people going for treatment, it affects the availability of treatment. Mm -hmm. Well, it was, it was great talking to you, Dr. Ostroff. Thank you and, for having me. Um, I think it's really important that the public know um, how important it is um, that people with mental illness get the support and the validation that they deserve, that it's an illness like any other illness, like a cardiac, you know, heart problem. And, and um, so uh, I, I totally agree with so much of what you've been saying tonight. And so, like I said, I just thank you very much for being on the show. And um, I, I want to thank the audience. I want to thank Sherry because Sherry was the one who told me about you and gave me the article and she's been really pushing to have this recognized for people to, to see and and I want to thank Josh Kelly the, the production production and um, Antoinette Jalper who does distribution and Abigail White that she um, she runs the, the studio and and I just want to thank everybody who's watching out there. And um, I just, uh, so what else? I'll just see you next month. And, you know, thank you. Mm -hmm.